Welcome everyone to this panel discussion on fixing a broken global order. Is it too late? Co-sponsored by the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies and the local program committee of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And we want to thank both the Macmillan Center and the American Academy for helping uh, arrange this event. All of you are invited after the event to a reception upstairs on the second floor. We're fortunate to have such a distinguished group of panelists, each of whom will speak for about seven minutes before we open the floor for discussion. And I just want all of you to know that this is being recorded, so you will be part of the public discussion should you choose to participate, and this will be uh, on the web page of the Macmillan Center and also on the American Academy. Mm. So I'm going to introduce very briefly the panelists. We're going more or less in alphabetical order and uh, then we'll, we'll get on with it. So first is Sam Cordham, the James Burrow Moffitt Professor of Economics, who is an authority on economic growth, innovation, technology diffusion, and firm dynamics. In 2004, he and Jonathan Eaton received the Frisch Medal for their paper, Technology, Geography, and Trade, published in Econometrica. In 2018, they shared the Onassis Prize <coughs> in International Trade. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society, member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Paul Kennedy is the J. Richardson Dilworth Professor of History and Director of the Maritime and Naval Studies Program at Yale. He's the author of, at last count, 19 books, including The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers and Preparing for the 21st Century, to name just two. He's a world-renowned authority on our topic of the day and is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the British Academy, and in 2000 was made Commander of the Order of the British Empire for services to the discipline of history. <laughs> Sorry. Ian Shapiro, Sterling Professor of Political Science at Yale, is an authority on democracy, justice, and methods of social inquiry. He's the author of many books, including a forthcoming book with Michael Gratz, The Wolf at the Door, which makes a case for domestic compensation to losers in the world economy as a way to stabilize global economic integration and prosperity, about which I'm sure he will be uh, speaking with us this evening. We expect that another book will soon follow, coming out of the Devane Lectures, which he is currently offering at Yale on the subject of politics in today's world. Jing Tzu the John M. Schiff Professor of Modern Chinese Studies and Comparative Literature at Yale and Chair of the Council on East Asian Studies, is also the author of numerous books, including most recently a book about how China entered the IT era, The Kingdom of Characters, colon, Language Wars and China's Rise to Global Power. She's received fellowships and honors from the Society of Fellows at Harvard, Woodrow Wilson Foundation, Center for Advanced <coughs> Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, New Directions Fellowship from the Mellon Foundation, uh, and most recently, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. <coughs> Professor Arnav Westat is a world-renowned scholar of global history. He's the author of many books, including one on China's international history since 1750, and most recently, a book entitled The Cold War, A World History. It's a book of power and breadth on the origins, conduct, and results of the Cold War. And this book, I can tell you, is available on Amazon's Audible Books. I couldn't put it down. Um, he's now writing about China's late 20th century integration into the world economy. He's a member of the British Academy, among others, and Yale is very fortunate to have recently wooed him. I don't want to say st stolen him Seduced. from Harvard uh, <laughs> University. So join me in uh, greeting our panelists, and then we'll get underway.
Okay. Um, it's a little scary to be leading this off. I'm, my expertise is, is mostly in international trade, so I'm going to focus on that part of the breaking, uh, breaking issue. Um, I guess to just list a few of the, the things that really worry us is the World Trade Organization is being weakened. Uh, we have a trade war with China that's disrupting supply chains. Um, U.S. tariff revenue just hit a record of $7 billion uh, this month. Now, you might say, okay, that's revenue, but that does point to a, a tax that we're paying of about a half a percent of our GDP, so it's not trivial. And I guess my main concern over all of this is not where we are, but the worry that we sort of broken a, a kind of convention and, and other countries might sort of follow the U.S. lead uh, in terms of what's happening. So, uh, but somehow when I was given the opportunity to speak here, I, I kind of wanted to remain optimistic and forward-looking. So I thought of the quote from uh, Rahm Emanuel, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And then I looked up, it's actually not from Rahm Emanuel, it's from Paul Romer. That even fit in better because he, he just won the Nobel Prize last year along with our own Bill Nordhaus. And then I wanted to talk about Bill Nordhaus anyway, so that was kind of nice. But anyway, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So is there some sense in which things are kind of torn apart and maybe we can rebuild them in a better way? So I was trying to think of a, a situation where that could be true, and that is what took me to thinking about uh, Bill Nordhaus, because he, um, uh, a few years ago, in 2015, uh, proposed uh, something called a climate club of a way for countries that want to do something about climate policy to be able to solve the um, free rider problem. That's the real issue with a global externality, is to get enough countries on board so you can actually do something. If you're just in a non-cooperative equilibrium, he has a nice little model where it shows you can only achieve about 12% of the, the, optimal, the optimal policy you should really engage in. So how does that uh, fit in here? Well, when uh, Bill Nordhaus's idea was to um, make this climate club. It would be something that countries want to be, and they're not forced, and they agree mutually on a, on a carbon tax that would be higher than e any of them would want to do on their own. And by, uh, so imagine uh, in, the, in the models of Nordhaus, that would be a carbon tax of about 40 to $100 per, uh, ton of CO2, which converts into somewhere 40 cents to a dollar per gallon, uh, something we sort of make it tangible. And the idea was that the non-member, to hold it together in a way that hasn't, wasn't done in the Kyoto Protocol and it seems to not be working too well with the Paris Accord either, uh, there was going to be a punishment of non-members. So they would be punished through an import tariff. Now when he, when Nordhaus proposed this, I was actually here at the Center for Study of Globalization. He was presenting in front of very distinguished people, and a lot of people pushed back as they said, you know, don't mess with a system that's as wonderful as what's happened in international trade. Over years, we've lowered tariff. We've sort of solved the prisoner's dilemma problem, that all kind of culminating in the World Trade Organization, which is that any country on its own actually, you know, as Trump finds out, it, you know, you do pretty well if you just raise a tariff. It's only if the other countries retaliate that you get hurt. So there's a kind of bad equilibrium where everybody's raising tariffs when we all end up with high tariffs, even though each of us thought we were going to gain something. So the one, one view of the World Trade Organization is a kind of a solution to that problem. And when people heard Nordhaus's proposal, they're sort of like, ah, that's kind of dangerous. We're opening up a can of worms. But I guess at this point, I feel like our president has already 
opened up a can of worms, so maybe we should think about the opportunities that that gives us to um, remake the system in a way that's more uh, amenable to, to such proposals. Um, so to kind of conclude, that, so in other words, try and make the best of a bad situation. When I mentioned this to a colleague, he was kind of angry with me. He said, you're going to say that World War II was good because after that we formed lots of good institutions. Well, no, but we're here. We, I'm not saying anything about how we got here, but I'm saying what we can do from the situation we find ourselves in. I think we find ourselves in a situation where international institutions are under stress. The world trading system is under stress. It could get worse. In reaffirming it, let's also tweak it in a way that makes it more amenable to achieving really the, 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 the huge goal that we have, which is to do something about the global, uh, do something about an effective global uh, climate policy. So that concludes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I suddenly realized as I was thinking about what I, my remarks for this afternoon, that it's almost exactly 25 years ago between the years of 1993 and uh, 95 that I and my colleague in political science, uh, Bruce Russett, were working on the problem of uh, restoring a broken global order. <laughs> Can it be fixed? Because Yale University and the Ford Foundation had come together at the invitation of the United Nations Secretary General to try to produce a report on how to get this world in a rather better shape through the instrumentation of international organizations and produce a report in time for the Secretary General to give it to all of the members of the General Assembly when they met in a special session at San Francisco in June 1995, because that would be the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations by the signing of the Charter in June 1945. The end result is a report which is called the United Nations in its second half century. I think that was probably the only few words I contributed to this report. I'm still quite proud about that. Um, and what we tried to do was to deal with a, at that time, pretty broken world order. They had been just after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fragmentation of countries in Eastern Europe had also been a, a massive outburst of civil wars, usually demographically driven, ethnically driven civil wars across Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia. Uh, the United Nations uh, blue helmets had gone up tenfold from 9,000 in the field in 1991 to 90,000 in the field in the year 1993. There were 19 peacekeeping operations. The system was buckling, and we were asked if we could think of ways in which uh, maybe a restructured international organization at the center of things might help fix the world order. So I'm just going to say a few remarks about that effort of ours why it didn't work, but why nonetheless I'm still a little bit optimistic about it. So we went ahead with a set of proposals which included the following, and I hope you would agree that it makes sense. We, we concluded that the Security Council, with its big responsibilities, just couldn't be pushed to one side as some reformers wanted it. You had, however, to enhance the Security Council by bringing in some significant players in world affairs above all India, but perhaps also South Africa, Brazil, maybe the two, two of the larger contributors to the budget like Germany and Japan, but we had to have Security Council permanent members from the South. We had to have a better response to, in, to crises of the collapse of what we called failed states. We had to uh, persuade the five great powers to stop using the veto except in extraordinary cases of threats to their own national security. 
rather than threatening to veto who might be the next candidate for, for Secretary General of the, of the United Nations, or the veto on this or that particular thing. It, it should be reduced in size. There should be a better coordination between the United Nations central organization and things like the UNDP and its organs mm -hmm. and the World Bank and the IMF, which had drifted way apart from the original intention which was to work in coordination with the United Nations rather than be totally independent, rather arrogant, looking down the nose at what these people did up in New York while we ran the world, essentially, uh, through our big money pockets. We produced a nice report and gave it to the Secretary General, uh, Boutros Boutros Ghali. At the time, he was in a great row with uh, Madeleine Albright, so that when, uh, because he wished to have another six-year term, uh, she was determined to get rid of him, and so he decided at the end not to take our fabulous Yale University report to San Francisco. <laughs> I learned quite a lot about this, and in, in sum, the great powers count, and if you do not persuade them, and I don't you know, I, I, I concede that persuading China and Russia at this time would be a very difficult thing indeed. The great powers count because of their veto. The South counts, and if we do not bring them into international organizations, then it is a busted thing. Um, what we need above all, clearly, is political leadership. And I see all of you shaking your head or sighing. Uh, I just hope that in five to 10 years' time, we, we will be at the, at the bottom end of a political leadership trough at the moment. I'm hoping it will, it will come up and we will get political leadership. But we need international structures of far greater power and authority and respect. I hope I will see them in my lifetime. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, um, for coming. Um, fixing a broken global order. So what, what is broken? Many things are broken, but what I want to address is the collapse of confidence in global institutions and, liber and a liberal economic order, free trade order, within the advanced democracies. And the, the, what I would say about this is that I, I, and argue this in the book Francis alluded to uh, that's coming out with Michael Gratz, uh, a principal cause of this collapse of confidence within the advanced democracies in the global uh, political and economic order is elite complacency about insecurity within these countries. Um, I think we have spent so much time in the last few decades talking about global institutions, global uh, or transnational institutions as uh, solutions to problems, but we've forgotten uh, an important uh, lesson that uh, was told to us by our former colleague in 1998, Jeffrey Garrett, who's now dean of the Wharton School, in a book called Partisan Politics and the Global Economy, that most politics is really national politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has, I think, been reiterated also by our former, another former colleague, uh, Adam Tooze, in his book on the financial crisis where he gives chapter and verse of the inability of transnational and international institutions, particularly in the case of the Eurozone crisis, to f confront problems, and that what has been done, uh, more or less successfully, has been done by national governments. So I think we've, we have uh, not paid enough attention to the role of national politics in managing uh, international institutions and in managing the fallout from changes in international institutions. I said that I think the principal cause of this loss of confidence is uh, elite insecurity, uh, e elite complacency about insecurity. And I want to emphasize that the, the insecurity I'm talking about is uh, principally employment insecurity. Um, in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, release of August of this year, 2019. They have been uh, studying the, uh, the, the number of times people have been changing jobs and they've been look, tracking 
the later baby boom generation born between 1957 and 64. And what you find there is those people uh, have changed jobs 12.3 times in their lifetimes. And if you look, um, only a small number of those changes is, can be accounted for like by summer jobs in college because the great majority of them are post uh, the age of 22 or 23. So we're living in a world in which lifetime employment has fundamentally vanished in these uh, economies. And uh, it's also a world in which there's increasing pressure on welfare states for demographic reasons as the uh, dependency ratio between the, the dependent retired populations and the working age pro, pro, uh, populations is squeezing governments. I think that uh, Donald Trump, whether by luck or uh, brilliant tactical insight, understood this insecurity. And I just want to emphasize that he understood it far better than the people he was campaigning against, for, for instance. Uh, if you compare his slogan, Make America Great Again, with Hillary Clinton's slogan, um, I campaign, I want to build a, I, I believe America's best days are ahead. They're actually both slogans of Ronald Reagan's from the 1980s. But when Reagan was saying uh, America's best days are in front of us, uh, it was before we'd had people living through three and a half decades of wage stagnation and um, basically replacing one, firmer, one, one family uh, incomes with two family incomes in order to, to keep treading water. Whereas the, the idea of make America great again uh, draws on what uh, political psychologists call loss aversion, that something's been taken away from you and I'm going to bring it back. And, and that was a, a very different kind of message uh, that uh, Trump sent. And then if you look at what Trump said uh, in his campaigning it, it campaign against Sanders, his differences with Sanders, uh, th they agreed uh, about the loss of jobs and they agreed in blaming uh, uh, trade for that. But, but for Sanders, it was all about inequality. It was all about the, what the top 1% are getting or 0.1% are getting. Um, and uh, Trump never mentioned inequality, not once. He said, uh, I'm going to bring your jobs back. I'm going to bring back what you, what, I'm going to get you back what's been taken away from you. He didn't even say what Reagan said, which is, I want an America in which anybody can get rich. Uh, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to, Get you back what you have lost. And uh, so he keyed right onto this insecurity. Now, of course, Trump is offering snake oil because to the extent job loss is about globalization, um, he doesn't have a strategy for getting significant numbers of jobs back to America and the structure of the world economy makes that basically impossible. He's certainly not going to do it by subsidizing agriculture and trade wars and, and reopening coal mines for a few thousand uh, people in, in Pennsylvania or where, wherever he's doing it. So he doesn't have a strategy for that. And besides, economists debate about how much of it's really trade and how much of it's technology. But he doesn't have a strategy for the fact that most, uh, a lot of these jobs are now in any case going to technology. The McDonald's restaurant that uh, used to have 20 workers in it and now has six workers in it probably will have two workers in it five years from now watching uh, robots making um, hamburgers. And so there's, again, no strategy for that either. So um, I, I think that if, if we want to restore uh, confidence in the capacity of uh, governments to actually deliver in sustaining the sorts of global institutions that we want to see that can address climate change, that can uh, uh, sustain free trade. We have to really think about what will will, what are the policies that will address uh, employment insecurity. And there there are things like taking seriously the fact that lifetime employment has gone away and is not coming back. 
That means we have to revisit. There used to be programs that largely failed in the US called trade adjustment assistance, where you would, in th the government would, in theory, allow uh, uh, subsidize for people to, to retrain when they lost jobs to trade. It can't just be a trade adjustment in uh, assistance. There's got to be uh, much more uh, comprehensive uh, adjustment insurance. There's got to have to be things like using expansions of the earned income tax credit. This is essentially a federal uh, government or state government subsidy for uh, employment. Um, it's one of the most, uh, one of the few genuinely redistributive programs that is gets bipartisan support. It started uh, in the in the Nixon administration and has been uh, supported by. Um, uh, parties on both sides of the aisle and expanded by parties on both sides of the aisle uh, many times. Uh, if you think about uh, state earned income tax credits, uh, unlike things like minimum wage, which tend to produce races to the bottom, it actually can produce races to the top uh, because uh, employers can come to different states uh, in search of better subsidized wages. Mm -hmm. There are other policies like uh, lifetime employment retraining uh, that has to be uh, funded at the national level and uh, other things of this general order. There's no silver bullet, uh, but these are the sorts of things that would address the employment insecurity that is at the heart of what is driving the populist politics that is undermining the global order. Um, thank you all for being here. and I'm very feel very honored to be flanked by some of the most respected colleagues here at Yale. Um, I spent most of my time studying America's present greatest adversary, um, China. And between switching perspectives here and there and understanding where the conflicts come from, how are they reading past each other, or is it just a simply a simple conflict of dominating will? I would have to re-ask the question of today's themes is whether it is a broken world order or we're witnessing a world order changing hands. Now, there are many ways in which I think the American public and media are quite resistant in thinking about this prospect. Um, but it does demand a kind of more total picture, a different kind of world picture than I think the one that we're accustomed to seeing here. Uh, for instance, I think we tend to still think of the problems that China raises in very specific silo terms. Um, whether it's in the area of science technology, we see that's different from human rights. Um, whether it's a protest, we see it also as something very different from what the policymakers in Beijing tend to do. Whereas it is very difficult, I think, and challenging to imagine just what kind of a grand strategy that we're in some ways confronting. Um, how, should we, how, how should we date it? Um, of course, the most readily example and uh, parallel that comes to mind to many observers is the Cold War. That is, is China the new Russia? And I think, uh, including my, the colleagues sitting right next to me, have disputed this idea that such a simple uh, historical precedent can be simply transplanted. And, but the, it is true that it's in, during the Cold War that the idea of a non-Western world order in the making was being discussed the famous Bandung Conference, um, at least to those who are outside of Russia and, and the US. Um, so we can think about this world order, the, the early shift of it already in the making in the 50s. Now, I think where China comes in and is sort of make it a particularly, I think, uh, um, challenging adversary is that it has been a superb understudy of the Western world order. Uh, for decades, if not, if you want to go with century humiliation, uh, one and a half century humiliation, 150 years or so. Mm. And it has absorbed, I think, many of the rationale from not just the US, but also Singapore, Japan, um, military strategies, of course, information as well. Um, back in the 70s, when China was first opening up, and there was actually kind of goodwill between US and China, at least unofficially, as you know, with Nixon's visit, landmark visit, um, China was really nowhere near uh, thinking of itself globally. But that was when 
it understood what it had to learn from the West. It impressed the Western side. There were several delegations, um, academics like ourselves, who travel back and forth. Um, these were the bridges that were supported, I think unofficially, that actually even was, was still kept at a trickle in the, through the 60s. That was immense goodwill on both sides. Um, China wanted to learn. The West wanted to spread this knowledge, wanted to collaborate. And it, sort of imagined that it, it was hard to imagine then that just a few decades later, that it would escalate to what we have today. So what are we looking at? Um, I think in many ways to think of China's, what kind of world picture it is proposing. It is one that, for instance, is development-based rather than rule-based, right? China's um, relationship to countries in Africa or Southeast Asia and have give us very different examples of where it seeks to push, where it can exert its power, and how it's willing to work with perhaps what the countries need on the, level, on the local level, rather than what they think should be ideologically um, disseminated worldwide. There's a very different kind of strategy, and I think a worldview. And when I talk to um, my Chinese counterparts, and actually not the, not the 60, 70 year olds, um, but with the up and coming <laughs> 30 and 40 year olds, I'll explain there is a generational gap as well in how this picture is being played out. Um, for the 30s and 40s who have parents who went through in 1989 and perhaps even Cultural Revolution, um, their parents tend to, I think, share similar views as Western observers. They're very critical, they, they put emphasis on human rights violations, political oppression, all those, or the, the very, um, the very thorny issues that we're still dealing with. But for the 30s and 40s, they also see a different picture, right? They grew up under a one-child policy. They tend to have been um, given great privilege and great resources. Um, they tend to invest quite a bit of hope in China as well, but with clear-eyed. They don't see, they don't idealize China as a patriot, but they do see that China is, will take a few decades will take well into 21st century to get to where it needs to be. And it is, this generation is in some ways pushed towards China, I think by the kind of what's been quoted to me as China bashing, that seems to be a kind of united strategy on the part of the West. And I think that is something to think about. Are we at the same time trying to fix or maybe trying to repair a world order? Are we just sowing seeds for more problematic and maybe similar replays in the future? And one of the things I would point out is also that you know, China has a kind of long game that I think is difficult for us to think about here, also because <coughs> our governance structure is very different. Um, here, every four years, we're, we're sure to, to see a battle and maybe certain policies repealed. Um, in China now, there's unlimited term on the current leadership. Um, there's a lot of time. There's a, a lot of time from their perspective to do what they need to do. We also see that China's building immense infrastructure around the world, uh, railroads, uh, ports, um, rail links, uh, freeways, um, airports. Um, and the last time that I think a, a country was able to connect a whole continent through a kind of road north-south and also across was basically the beginning of the American empire. Except now I think China is actually doing it worldwide. Um, most of you, of course, know about BRI, and I think even two, three years ago, it was often kind of laughed off as a kind of a vanity project or something that's more name than substance. But then, lo and behold, it is essentially a world project, right? It's going up into the Arctic, going south through Latin America. There's not a corner of the earth that is not, not in some way figured into the Belt Road Initiative plan. So I think when we think about world order, um, I would say a lot of it depends on how the rest of the world responds. That even though we think of ourselves as sort of increasingly in a multipolar world, but our conversation very much still evolves between something like US and an opponent and a strong adversary. And I think that yeah. itself is kind of a misleading path. Mm. I think what is neglected is because of the fact that we have, let's say, an existing superpower and a contending superpower um, um, having a face off at the moment that it actually gives rest of the world opportunities. We might think about even from the trade war, who are the big winners? Uh, Singapore and Vietnam. Um, eight months ago, the factories in Taiwan were ready to move into, we're, we're looking for warehouses to move into in Vietnam. So there's a lot of more local regional players that I think tend to be left out 
of the global picture when we talk about world order, right? And I do absolutely agree that great powers matter and great powers count. But I think now, because of the uncertainty, I think both in this country, but also regionally in Asia, that there's actually tremendous opportunity that's open up um, for countries like Africa, in Africa or Southeast Asia and Latin America. And certainly if I were one of those countries, I would think about how to best gain the situation where there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of room for maneuver. So I will leave it at that. Mm. It's wonderful to um, be here with uh, some of the colleagues here at Yale who I most admire. Um, and uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you coming out for the discussion today. Um, thanks to Francis for, for, for organizing this. So I, I think I'll, I'll take as my starting point the question that is in the title, <coughs> can it be fixed? And I think to that I have a pretty straightforward answer. It depends on whether Donald Trump is reelected as US president <laughs> next year or not. Um, so if that happens, then the international cooperative world that many have dreamt of bringing into being after the Cold War ended is probably not going to happen in our lifetime. Uh, because the institutions, as we've heard now from several distinguished colleagues, the institutions on which such a world order, any kind of world order would depend, would be weakened to the point that they cannot bear the weight of the developments that we are seeing at present. Uh, that's the significance of that election. So uh, there are lots of things happening elsewhere in the world as well that we need to look at. But this is the one occasion in my lifetime where it's very clear that for Americans, the key question about what kind of world we are going to live in in the future can be answered here, first and foremost, through, through what happens in American politics next year. <coughs> so I say this for two reasons. Um, the first one is that I believe that we are now in a global power shift, uh, where we are moving away from the unipolarity in global affairs that the end of the Cold War created. So the end of the Cold War really meant that there was only one great power left standing, and that was the United States of America. So for some time, and for quite good, and if I may say natural reasons, we've been moving away from that. Um, I agree with Jing that we are not moving towards bipolarity, so United States and China. I think we are moving pretty fast towards multipolarity. So different powers in different parts of the world possibly on a regional basis, that are going to be more significant in terms of how the global system of the future uh, is, being put, is being put together. This, it's from my perspective, that's not necessarily bad. The problem at the moment is the speed with which it's happening under the current administration. Um, because if there, is, if there is one thing that we can learn from history, and the one who's helped us learn that more than anyone else is, is Professor Kennedy, who is here today, is that power shifts may be good or bad, but first and foremost depends on how they take place and how quickly they take place. So very rapid power shifts have an almost unerring um, uh, legacy of ending up in cataclysmic wars. Power shifts that take a longer period of time have at least a chance for arrangements to be worked out so that it's possible for the major powers and for the rising powers to work together, uh, at least to secure the peace, if not necessarily cooperate on a broad scale. And what the Trump administration has done through its policies, which in reality, whatever way you put it, uh, implies a US withdrawal from the world. It has made our allies much more insecure. It has emboldened regimes that normally would, for good reasons, have been worried about what kind of actions their uh, initiatives would set off with regard to the United States, now are less concerned about it. It has sped up the very power shift that Trump, of course, in his rhetoric, by saying America first, uh, has promised people that he would stand up against. Um, so this is something I think is really, really important uh, to consider, that uh, the, the, the power shifts dynamic that we have been looking at has sped up tremendously. And uh, I think possibly with some quite catastrophic results, unless the United States finds a way of using its power 
selectively and, 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 and in well-defined ways to try to create a world that is more stable than what we are looking at at the moment. That won't happen under a Trump presidency, whatever you think about a Trump presidency in other, in other, uh, in other directions. So China, of course, is particularly important in this, as, as, as Jing uh, pointed out. But it's not the whole story. Uh, there, there are many other things that are happening in terms of change that indicates that this power transition process has been, been sped up. And again, if you think about it historically, so I'm an historian by trade, won't surprise you to hear me say this, uh, that that's one of the ways we should approach these, uh, these issues. We have to think about parallels and analogies from the past. And as I've been arguing elsewhere, to me, even though I spent a fair amount of my career studying the Cold War, it is not the Cold War that first and foremost comes to mind when you look at how international affairs are being reconstituted today. It is, and uh, I'm afraid I have to say this, it looks much more like the late 19th century, so the period before World War I, or even the interwar era, uh, where things seem to move very quickly in the direction of a number of very strong uh, nationalistic great powers competing for power, uh, economic advantage, and influence on a, on, on a global scale. Compared to those systems, the Cold War was actually remarkably stable. It was dangerous, <coughs> first and foremost because of the threat of, of nuclear annihilation, but it had a promise built into it that both of these powers were here to try to improve the world. So, we would argue, I have argued, that that didn't always work out uh, uh, for, for, for either of the two sides. But there was a stability to the system that we simply didn't find prior to 1949, uh, prior to, to 1914 or, or in the interwar era. So that's the first reason why this election will be so significant, that we have a power shift situation that is being pushed by the very country that has been up to now at the center of the international system. The second one, uh, which has been alluded to already, so I'll, I'll, I'll be quick on this, is that Trump dramatically reduces the potential on a global scale for international cooperation, even on issues beyond strategic conflict, on issues that are really, really important, such as global health or, or climate change. And these issues are important in themselves. I mean, they. Our, our common future cannot be secured without these being addressed. Many people see that. But what I think fewer people see is that there is also a spillover from these issues increasingly to the international situation in general. So if the sense is that we cannot work together and that the United States cannot play a leadership role in trying to deal with these acute issues that are before us, then no one else will step up to the plate either. Everyone will first and foremost look after their, their own interests. So in conclusion, I, I, one of the things that I worked on in the past is being very critical of US foreign policy with regard to taking on too many uh, obligations, being too interventionist, mm -hmm. attempting to be the world's policeman. And I still stand by that. But if you compare much of that critique from myself and others with what is actually happening today, and particularly happening in Eastern Asia, which is by far the most significant region in terms of what is going to happen in the future, how um, uh, unstable the situation there can easily become because of a rapid US withdrawal, then I'm certainly on that issue on the other side of the equation. I don't think that a United States that is seen as not being able to handle problems uh, dealing with China and dealing with the East Asian region around China is helping to make the world more secure. Uh, quite on the contrary, I think that's the region where a, a, a dramatic power shift, a power shift that happens very quickly, would have the most uh, catastrophic uh, results. Thank you. Um, we are now going to open the conversation to the floor, and we have some mics. Uh, and so if you would like to ask questions of the panelists, this is the time to raise your hand. So, um, 
Thank you. Thank you very much for your, um, for your presentation. It's been very um, interesting. However, I found one element missing of, your, uh, of, of the five presentations of you um, that you made. Um, we, you all talked about um, countries, um, but I thought that the element that the sovereign of the order or the beneficiaries of the order was missing, and that is the people in this room, the, the laymen, the real people. So I turn on the TV these days, and what I see are protests. I see protests everywhere. I see protests in Ecuador, protests in Chile, protests in Hong Kong, protests in Lebanon, protests in Catalonia, and the list could go on. And my question is, what is our role, the role of the people, in changing the order? Can we fix, do we have any role? Do we have any agency? Can we fix the order? Or there is no role for us, and everything is left to the countries? Thank you. Who would like to take that on? <laughs> You may all do so, but choose an order. Jane? Um, thank you for that comment. I think it, it's, it's, it's actually a great issue because we are seeing what one of our former colleagues here, Wallerstein, will call anti-systemic movements, often for different reasons. And there's a way in which the people actually has a power that it had not before which is the ability to organize via social media. is actually technology is a huge, I think one thing that does speed up this process of power shift <coughs> is also technology. Um, there are people who anticipate a, a, a decoupled world. I think this is Kevin, Kevin Rudd's platform, but also technologically, Elon mm. Musk anticipates that it wouldn't be inconceivable that 2040s, 2050, we would have an internet that's basically still goes by the West American a standard and another one that basically goes by China. Mm. And it's perfectly conceivable just because of all this infrastructure building, right? I think in terms of what people, I think in fact, what would be the random, the variable, and the unknown factor is what will happen within these countries, right? And China in particular is very alarming. I mean, people don't, most people don't know this, but there are thousands of protests in China, like the ones that, that, the ones that will actually cause labor stoppage. Um, every year, and very few make it across the media. Mm. Um, the fact of ruling over such a gigantic population, and I think this is a kind of question of scale that we all know China is very big. As as one of our, our colleagues at the Financial Times, you know, it's China big, China bad, China weird. You know, it's one of those three things. <laughs> but scale, actually, it is really hard to imagine what that is unless you've walked through Shenzhen or Hong Kong or Beijing, and just to think about. If you were applying for college now, how many of these people you would have to compete against to get into a place like Yale? And I think for those, for, for China, governance, first of all, within its borders is incredibly important. And I think it's because the people have the ability to disrupt. And you will see that social, the protest movements now is not so much a top of governance. It's really about disruption, right? Enough to just be that thorn in your side. And they're also, they also coalesce around different causes. You might also notice that. It's mm -hmm. not that the people have one particular grievance, but they all find a way to come together for that movement. So I think it is, I think the people, without sounding Marxist and betraying my, my undergraduate background at Berkeley, I think that is key. That is the unaccounted for and that's still hopeful factor. Who else wants to tackle that one? Uh, well, I'll just say briefly that I think that people can't spontaneously have much sustained effect in politics, that there's a reason we have political parties and political institutions. And unfortunately, what's gone on over the last four decades, this is really alluding to my book uh, last year with Francis on responsible parties, but what's happened is as people have felt increasingly out of control of their futures and as people have experienced the insecurity uh, that I was talking about in my earlier remarks, one dominant response across much of the developed world has been to, dem to basically weaken political parties, to demand more uh, direct control in the, in the uh, decision making through referendums and plebiscites, Brexit uh, and so forth, to uh, uh, get more and more grassroots control of political decision making within parties and in the selection of candidates uh, through primaries, uh, direct election of party leaders and so forth. And the, the result of all of this is to make it decreasingly, feas decreasingly possible for governments to govern. 
Um, they are hamstrung, uh, even in countries like Germany that used to have very strong political parties you see now. It takes seven months to form a government that has to be approved uh, at the grassroots level by the 450,000 members of the SPD. And so what, what you get is a, a world in which governments can't govern, and then people feel even more disempowered and alienated that, by the fact that they can't govern, uh, and that leads to uh, demand, de demands for more mm -hmm. local control. So uh, I think that the, the real answer is mm -hmm. to, to strengthen parties um, so that they can deliver the, th the things that people want uh, rather than engage in this um, cycle of, of weakening the capacity of governments mm -hmm. to govern. Uh, anything else from the panel? <clears throat> Supposing every one of those protests in all of those countries led actually to the governments in all of those countries being responsible, democratic, aware of global challenges, mm. parliamentary governments, mm. <clears throat> then the link would have been made between what's happening on the street there and those governments being able to work with other governments to actually get things done in a organized and agreed way through organizations which we have. I made the point earlier that I don't think we're going to get this global, this broken global order fixed until responsible governments step in and do that at various levels, whether it's socioeconomic or uh, environmental accords or dealing with breakdown of uh, law and order and trans uh, border mayhem, but it has to be governments. But I'm rather hopeful that sometimes these protests mm. lead to governments which are reformist governments. Why shouldn't they be? Okay, so I think we're going to go to the questions that were up here in front and let us know. Okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Really, really interesting discussion and, and, um, and talk, so thank you very much. Um, my question was, I wondered if you could comment on global population size and structure, and my question has two main parts. Um, the first part is, to what extent would you say the current brokenness of the world order is due to global overpopulation? Um, and then secondly, if we are in fact looking at creation of a new world order um, with China at the fore rather than a, a broken order, um, would you say the difference in population structure between China and the USA would be a major driver of that handover? Hmm. So I'm not sure. So I, I, I do think it's true that demographic increase has driven some of the resource-based resource and, and <coughs> distributory issues that's behind what Ian was, was, was uh, talking about earlier on. But I do think we are at the tipping point with regard to, the, with regard to this. Um, uh, as you know, we are both with regard to world population growth overall, which is now turning towards a more uh, downward trend. But maybe especially if we look at the relationship between the powers that is, are assumed to have, had, to have the greatest influence in the future. So uh, I believe that the uh, unprecedented decline in, in the number of, of, of Chinese, and particularly young Chinese, those who will be uh, working and, and staffing all of the, the factories over that, you know, that's the, mili the, 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 the military enterprises, a demographic decline in terms of the number of young people, the equal of which in relative terms the world has never seen before, is going to have a very strong impact on, on what happens in, in global affairs. It won't happen. So demographic change, of course, <laughs> takes almost by, so implicitly a generation uh, to, to be seen. But in, in a generation, I think this is going to be really significant. This is one of the reasons why I'm saying that I'm pretty sure we are not heading towards bipolarity, that we are heading towards multipolarity. Because one of the things that a country in the future will need to have in order both to sustain itself and make its mark internationally is a healthy demographic profile. And fewer and fewer countries outside of Africa 
have a healthy demographic profile, right? Uh, because, I mean, China is in a, in a position all, all by itself for reasons uh, that are mainly self-inflicted, the, 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 the one-child one child policy. But you see similar trends in Europe, and, and, and you see them increasingly, I think, in other, in other parts of the world as well. Where this will lead, we don't know. I mean, what I'm pretty sure of is a world that is getting rapidly older uh, will not be a world that will necessarily be better uh, suited for dealing with the kind of problems that we are talking about on a, on a global scale. And I think the countries that are at the forefront of that uh, demographic turn towards uh, uh, older populations will probably be the ones that are less capable of contributing to it. Yeah. Paul and then Sam, I don't know if you have something you want to say about demography and global order. <laughs> Boy, what a question. It took uh, all of world history to 1875 to get a population of one billion on this planet. Uh, by 1925, 50 years, it was two billion. By 1975, it was four billion. By the year 2000, it had just crested six billion. It's now 7.8, 7.9 billion. The best estimates of the UN Population Fund are something like 9.5 billion people on this planet by around about 2040. 90% of the increase of that coming in Africa. Uh, the aging is another phenomenon. Um, and then there's a question of whether we really do want, ladies and gentlemen, all of the 9.5 billion to be raised up to the level of Kansas, which is what that senator said uh, famously in the middle of the Second World War. He looked forward to the time when everybody in the world would be raised up to the level of Kansas. That is to say, with a GDP per capita of something like thirty-five thousand dollars, which would mean that the world was utterly devastated in resource and climatic terms. Uh, the dilemmas of this population issue and the way in which it will break through from time to time uh, are sometimes beyond, beyond, beyond ways in which I, 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 can, I, I can't think through all of the consequences of that, except that I think that uh, to ignore the demographic uh, push uh, in world affairs over the next uh, 10 or 25 years and to think that we should be concentrating only on the atomic issue or only on the trade issue or only on technology issue or only on what to do with the big four uh, means that we would, there's some bigger thing happening involving most of the planet. Thank you. We have somebody in the back, and just raise your hand, and we'll we'll keep you in mind for the next round. Uh, Professor Kennedy, uh, um, uh -oh. uh, Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, all, uh, but especially Professor Kennedy, Professor Jingsu, and Professor Wester, they had all discussed U.S.-China relations. In particular, one of the comments was that, um, correctly, I, I, I think that Trump has played a key role in um, a worsening of U.S.-China relations and uh, sort of led to a worsened U.S. role in the world. But at the same time, in Washington, D.C., there appears to be a bipartisan consensus on um, having adopting a tougher stance towards China and uh, scaling back on America's um, commitments abroad. So my question then is, do you think this changing, uh, worsening US-China relations and um, a reduced America's role in the world, do you think that is contingent upon the policies pursued by the next administration, or do you think that, would, that is likely to happen irrespective of the administration that comes next? Well, we have two great China experts on this panel just along the end. I'll let you take the first. <laughs> <laughs> well, he always leaves the most difficult questions to me. Um, so I think, I mean, the, 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 the current predicament, as I, as I tried to underline in my opening remarks, is very much uh, in, in, your, in your question, right? Now. I think, so... Uh, this administration has, certainly on trade, but also on a, some strategic issues, 
a more confrontational approach to China than what previous administrations have had. But that's happening at the same time as the very same administration seems to be uh, very preoccupied in a deliberate way with reducing the U.S. overall influence in Eastern Asia by, by having uh, falling out with, with, with long-term allies, with building down the links to newer friends of the United States, Indonesia, Vietnam, India, um, and, and in general signaling to the leaders in Beijing uh, that we're going to confront you uh, by all means that won't cost us a thing. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we can sit back here and we do well out of the tariffs, as Sam, as Sam showed, we, we, we will be number one. You know, that's not how world power works. Uh, and, and this is the reason why, I'm, why I'm, I'm worried. So I think you're right in saying that uh, even if we get uh, a new administration in, in place uh, after the next fall, I do think there will be significant tensions in the U.S.-China relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of this has to do with the structural aspect of things, right? I mean, you're dealing with one established great power, sees itself as certainly the number one power in the world, the United States, and, and a rising power that is seen as a challenger to, to this, this hegemon or whatever way one should understand the United States. The tensions come out of that quite... Is quite, is quite understandable. They're different in character, they're different in area, they're different in history and background. The, the big question is how, how can one handle those kinds of issues? And this is what I'm afraid of. So I think that this idea of a decrease in American commitments to deal with other countries in Asia, which, for, which in many ways are themselves rising, <laughs> and not least rising in terms of what they see as their own, their own potential power and, and influence, that that would destabilize uh, the region uh, much more than what a continued, even as, at a scaled down level, American presence would lead to. So that's what my hope after the next election year, that we get an administration that looks pretty cold, cold eyed at this, that there will be tensions and conflicts between the United States and China, as there will be between the United States and other countries, not least on trade issues. But that's not the reason to forego an order that has been able for a very long time to keep the peace in Asia. Uh, that's my view. Well, you need something to rebuild par bipartisanship on. So I think regardless, yeah. <laughs> so that, I suppose that's as good as any. And it's absolutely true, I think, that you know, China's rise to power would not have been possible without America's simultaneous retreat from the world stage. I think that's very, very clear. Um, but I think from China's perspective, regardless of what the next administration is like, it is not going to change its plans too much. Um, I think for many years now, for at least several years, it's clear that United States is an important, a very important, but not a decisive factor for China. Mm -hmm. And you can see that China has been building essentially a containment strategy by essentially building out into the world um, so that it can use it as a way of buffering whatever is happening with, let's say, with the trade war. You can see that. It just moves elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Huawei's banned while Huawei is building these high-tech cities in Ethiopia, Kenya, et cetera. Um, it is basically bankrolling them, um, giving them almost equivalent foreign aid. So I think it's very clear that China has built a kind of network and global infrastructure where it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a spider web. I mean, it's like if one side gets plucked, it's the, it can, it can, the pressure can echo elsewhere. So it has been building that kind of nimble capacity worldwide. I think so that, mm. so that it would not be beholden to any particular one power on what it might do. Uh, we had somebody there in the blue shirt and then up, up right here. So several of you uh, recently spoke about uh, the, the need to empower people or make government more accountable to, um, to the people. And Professor Westat, you uh, suggested that you think we're returning to or that the future will most resemble the multipolar era of the period between 19, 1900 and 1945. Of course, as several of you know, I'm sure that this period was one in which leaders used public opinion to justify either inaction in foreign policy or uh, aggressive expansionist policies. Um, 
Are you concerned that increasing popular empowerment uh, in this century uh, may have similar effects? And uh, if so, how might those dangers be tempered? Uh, yes, I think that the, 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 the um, idea that popular empowerment um, is a solution to the problem, you gotta ask, well, popular empowerment at the expense of what? And if it's the expense of political parties that can actually govern, um, then it, it's gonna exacerbate the danger. And I, I agree with Arne that the, the parallels are to, to the pre-World War I and interwar period are, are the most striking parallels. That's, it's, it's also an era with those, particularly the interwar period was an era of growing employment insecurity in many uh, of the established democracies. It was a period of great party fragmentation in the European systems, which we're also seeing now. And it was a period in which uh, um, demagogues mobilized populist opinion against existing party systems. And, and uh, so I, I do think that the, the, the solution is, is not uh, lots of popular empowerment, but rather the empowerment of parties that can actually govern. And actually, can I just add one footnote? I think, you know, power empowerment is all great, but you have to also realize right now we have a very big issue with being empowered on the wrong kind of information, mm. right? I mean, misinformation can fan popular mm. actions in ways that are very mm. frightening. If you think at the, the violence uh, in, in Southeast Asia, um, I think that's, it, it's, it's also about, you know, what kind of, because it used to be popular uprising, you have, you have a goal. You know what your ideology is. You know that what they get, you know where each other stand. But these days it's very difficult, and popular opinions are themselves being swayed one way or the other, right? Mm -hmm. We know that for certain, something very alarming, mm -hmm. obviously. Now, some of this goes back to, again, what, what Ian raised at, at the beginning. So, uh, you know, you can understand where this reaction comes from. I mean, it's a reaction against what could be seen as failing state capacity to act for you, to act for the, the individuals who, particularly in this country, who feel that having won the Cold War, having gone through all the changes that, enormous changes that have taken place in terms of the economy of this country since then, uh, which are often not you know, commented on enough, how this country has gone from making things to, to becoming a center for financial capital and a center for high-tech development, which, which has you know, made life really difficult for people who were connected to, a, to the productive economy that this country stood for for a very long time. And, and within less than a generation, it has gone from, the United States has gone from being the world's largest capital exporter to becoming the world's largest capital importer. And of course, this has consequences for people's daily lives. And, and in particular, I think this is visible here now, because unlike other powers that have experienced what you could call relative decline over a period of time, there has been almost no social safety net for the people who have been hurt as a result of this readjustment in the, in the, US, in the US position. Uh, you know, a lot of bad things could be said about British decline in the mid mid 19th century, mid 20th century, but there were, uh, uh, at least for a while, there were institutions in place that could actually look after some of the people who were the worst hurt by this kind of development. You do not get that here. And I think in order to understand the reaction that we've got now in American politics, one has to understand that, perhaps more than understanding just the international framework. Could I just add, since you brought up Britain in the in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century, it's it's a no, it's notable that it had much stronger political parties and and uh, uh, in Britain in the 1930s there were there were fascists as well. The Mosleyites, for example, had uh, more members in 1936 than the Nazi Party had in Germany. But because they had two strong political parties, they couldn't get a foothold in Parliament. I'm going to pass on that. Okay. Uh, yes. So if, um, if we could go back to the discussion between China and the US and their kind of relative positions on the world stage. M maybe I'm misreading your narrative a little bit, but it seemed to me that 
China has been biding its time for quite a, you know, keeping a low international profile, but that has now changed, and it is like with the Belt and Road Initiative as like the typical example, mm -hmm. it is trying to take more of a, a leadership role internationally. Um, and as we've discussed, mm. the U.S. is stepping back, and it, that there is an appetite within the U.S. to mm. withdraw some support from the U.N., withdraw from its kind of more um, ex expansionist military or interventionalist kind of um, behavior that it has been as the global hegemon mm. doing over the last few decades. And so, to me, that doesn't seem like a recipe for a clash. It seems like as one retreats, the other maybe steps in. I mean, do you, so, but presumably there will be sticking points, and, and where do you think those would be? Like, is, is it the cultural hegemony that um, is where America will suddenly feel like it, that, that relationship will become inflamed? Or is it military, you know, expansionism? Or is it where democracy is no longer being um, portrayed as like the, the global ideal? Um, so I guess, and I guess one further point is that, um, as the US maybe puts down some of these um, like leadership of international institutions, uh, do you see that China may try and pick up that leadership role, but maybe in more of a bilateral sense, not within the structures um, of the UN, for example, that we've seen up to this point? Um, those institutions have been well underway, right? The Asia Infrastructure Development uh, Investment Bank um, the Silk Road Fund, and I think you're absolutely right that just in the past, I think, couple of years, you know, the, the keeping low, just want harmony kind of rhetoric really changed. Um, one of the very clear instances is, you know, like, like about maybe 18 months ago, uh, there was this, this group of scientists under Chinese Academy of Scientists who specialize in Tibetan Plateau, Himalayan Plateau. And they put forth this argument that they're the third pole that is say North Pole, South Pole, and then there's a third pole because they share certain climactic, you know, similar biomass issues, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason they came up with that is because China wants to be at the seat of the table at the Arctic. Why the Arctic? Um, you know, the Arctic's been melting in some ways faster than the rest of the world. And with a through waterway, mm the shipping time that it takes to go from Northwest Europe to mm. um, Asia uh, will be reduced by a third if you go that route, reduced by one third. That is quite significant. And you can dodge the taxes or the, the tax you have to pay, the Suez Canal and you know, Malacca, if you look at this marine, you know, marine map in real time, it's, it's always congested. So this is actually very, very important and a kind of a, a real, I don't want to overuse that, but a real game changer I think for global trade and also oil tankers and et cetera, et cetera. So for China, they've been, they were very, you know, very, very cautiously trying to play nice, and this is just for scientific exploration. And this has really changed in the past six months or eight months. And it's now much more aggressive. It really thinks that it has a role to play in the Arctic. Um, it, it's, it's, it's changing, and this, this type of rhetoric sort of changing everywhere in this reach. And I think in part is in response to US. Um, because the, the clash has been so great that it decides it, it's mm -hmm. that if you listen, if you read, you know, what's reported in Chinese media, it really is this very incendiary but very hurt kind of rhetoric that recalls, of course, the center humiliation and so on and so forth. But it is kind of a long process. I think a lot of the times we think about, you know, China, U.S. is really about what's happening now like it's never happened before. So it occurs to me, counting, that uh, two of the five experts are here are China experts, and uh, four of the seven questions posed by the audience have somehow to do with China and China and the United States. So uh, regardless of this I don't know, particular question of, of restoring a broken global order, there is something else going on in one's national sentiments and, and mm -hmm. national apprehensions. And it is what Arne was talking about a little bit before is, uh, and the, the very good question here about whether a change of administration in this country 
or a change of administration on the Chinese side would make much difference if there is just a long-term secular shift <laughs> in the global economic balances. If it was the case, as some economists, I'd love to have Sam now come in on this, if it was the case, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, our American GDP would grow roughly like 2.25% 2, 2 per annum over the next 10, 20, 30 years, and the Chinese GDP would grow not at the rate it's been doing in the past 30 or 40 years, but it just grew at 4.5% to 5% a year, then that simply means that there is a, a, a huge secular shift regardless of who is in government in one side of the Pacific Ocean or on the other side. And this strikes me that now I, I feel I'm back in some sort of echo way where we were about 35 years ago, where every, every event I came to about international affairs here was about Japan mm -hmm. and uh, the Japanese threat and the Japanese challenge and the Japanese buying the Rockefeller Plaza. And I was switched, but I think, and I like the comments of the three of you, um, I think that the, it's a bigger shift. It's a much, much bigger shift than any perceived and, as we saw, short-term rise of Japan to challenge the American position in the world. Same. Well, I, I just wanted to start with something trivial, which is with those different growth rates, yeah, it'll, mm -hmm. China's going to double relative to the U.S. in around 30 years. So mm -hmm. that's a pretty big change. And I guess, but the problem is, I, I guess in, in our economics way of thinking, we wouldn't put so much weight on just the pure side. I think the political and international relations part where I feel I'm not out of my, out of my league, uh, that matters. But just for the pure economics of it, I'm, I'm not so sure that's the, such an important uh, issue. And I, I mean, I guess I kind of wonder also about the, you know, the what Jing brought up about the going through the Arctic and so on. It's very intriguing, and yet I think that's not going to be first order for what China's. I mean, you know, I was just looking at China's exports to the U.S. have fallen twenty percent in one year. I doubt that going through the Arctic is going to really be of that magnitude, and somehow they're they're living through that. So, um, one more thing, I guess, while I'm have the mic is thinking on that last question that uh, Francis asked me to respond to, and I was a little slow. One thing I I recently was looking at about the decline of manufacturing, and Arne brought that up about, and it's certainly true. But it's just steady. It's just a perfect line of the fraction of yeah. US workers in manufacturing sector from 1950 to about um, uh, to, to the Great Recession, just straight as an arrow. So why is it suddenly right at the end of that? Mm. So the rate of change, it's, it couldn't go on like that forever. It would go mm. minus, and now it's kind of flattened out. But, but mm. why all of a sudden was that so disruptive? I, I believe it could be, but I think there's a big question there about why now. And maybe, so maybe it's just a sort of thing, always an irritant that interacted with other things. So I guess I'm not so sure of it being the mm. causal, or at least not the one causal mm. Mm. factor. Well, Sam, do you want to just follow up with, so if manufacturing is going down, what is going mm. up, and, and is there an optimistic story there? Mm. Well, yeah, I think, uh, well, if we think about the 
I mean, we're moving to, uh, I, I do feel a lot of these trends are not all bad. I mean, if we're a bunch of old people, we'll all be docilely sitting around, if we're young, taking care of old people, and if we're old, being taken care of, and probably won't be as much <laughs> conflict. Uh, and, uh, well, it'll be, it'll be at a smaller scale, the conflict, I guess. And, uh, but what would, oh, and, and of course we're moving, I mean, I think a big issue to kind of tie back into the China issue is that we're kind of moving into a world of everything being intangible. And so I think that's a big part of this China issue mm. is the property rights over intangibles. And mm. I do feel that, that that's where, you know, the administration has something of a point. I don't know if that's, that may be a kind of cover for something else, but that's where there's a sort of mm. logic to their irritation mm. with uh, China, I think, mm. is that we probably do need to be a world that respects uh, property rights over over intangibles if we're going to mm. kind of move into a world where we don't have so much manufacturing and mm. everything sort of... Uh, if anybody here is an expert on 5G and whether it's more of an economic <laughs> issue or a security <laughs> issue and how those play in the U.S.-China, yeah. is anybody an expert on that? 5G? <laughs> Anyone? I, I know Arna wanted to... Um, jump in on this. There was a hand up there, and there's a hand yeah. here. I, I, this is more just on the lining Sam's question about why now, which I think is a really, really important question. Because, you know, th these have been trends that have been going on for a long time, and of course, mm -hmm. what happened in 2008, 2009 accentuated much of this. Uh, but I must confess that that is, I think, one of the most important issues to try to figure out. I mean, what, what, the only part of the answer I think we know, and I am talking about the situation in the United States, is that a certain kind of manufacturing jobs was probably declining more quickly, even before the Great Recession took hold, than in other parts of the manufacturing sector. And it's possible that it's that, in social terms, that un unleashed you know, this tremendous political anger in terms of a of, of, a, of a, an overall process that has been going on for much longer. Uh, that's not much of an answer, but it's a really, really important question. Um, and it's a question that, again, brings echoes of earlier historical periods. So why do long-term trends that people would see as negative suddenly lead to a deep fundamental distrust of institutions and of elites? We have 10 minutes before we're going to adjourn to the upstairs reception and the conversation can continue. But just to say, let's get the last few questions, maybe keep your comments and questions a little on the brief side. Just quickly, um, we've spent most of this time and we haven't really mentioned the European Union. Where do you see, do you see it as becoming a mediator between the US and China? Do you see it asserting itself and and you know, kind of becoming a three-part power structure, or do you see it becoming utterly irrelevant and splintering, um, in, you know, facing both pressures? Well, I think, uh, um, you know, in, to, in 2006, um, um, we, we saw the publication of Tony Judd's book, Post War, shortly before he died. And, and one of the many themes in that book was that the EU has always been an elite project. And uh, the first time it hits a real challenge, it, look out. Uh, and he was certainly right about that. And, I, and just to come back to, to the two's book, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a really stunning documentation of the inability of the, of the EU to coordinate uh, any kind of response to Eurozone crisis for years and years and years. And um, it, it certainly seems to be an open question whether the EU is consolidating or deconsolidating at this point. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't buy a lot of stock in the idea that they will be mediating much. Thank you. Uh, I, have, I have a question for Professor Kennedy. And you made the comparison of um, Japan 35 years ago to China today. 
And I wonder if we can, we can put the two countries together, because uh, in 2015, the Prime Minister of Australia, he told Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, that two feelings drew, drew our relationship with China. One is greedy, one is fear. That means China now make, give people the feeling of fear. I want to know. Japan, 20, 35 years ago, when, Jap when Japan was trying to buy the world, uh, did people have the feeling of fear? Because we, underst we understand why today China gives the people the feeling of fear, because there is no rule of law, no separation of power, and the president can remain on place until the end of his day. So can we make the, can we, can we make the, same, the same statement with Japan 35 years ago and China today. Thank you. Thank you. A very pertinent question, ladies and gentlemen, about whether the, that fear of Japan, which many of you in this audience remember, mm -hmm. the Japanese challenge, uh, the, 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 the penetration of uh, the, the world economic order, the, the unfairness, the imbalance, etc. Uh, in some ways leading to Sean Connery movies, <laughs> uh, leading to a, a, a belief that this, this was something that we'd find very hard to handle, uh, was outrageous that we defeated them in the Second World War, now they were coming and getting us in an insidious way. Could this, is this, is that set of sentiments of fear and worry now repeating itself with regard to China. Mm -hmm. And I would say yes, in many parts of the country, mm -hmm. it is. There is a China on the brain uh, phenomenon across mm -hmm. the United States, just as there was a, a Japan on the brain phenomenon. Uh, you did not ask me whether I think uh, the fear is valid, so I'm going to duck that particular question. <laughs> but I think that to, to watch what's happening is, is it's clear that it is very, very similar indeed. Ian, mm -hmm. Ian I think there was an additional element to your question about the comparability. You said fear and greed. Mm -hmm. And Look, I, I just, my memory is that a, words like greed and words like cunningness and words like uh, deviousness and words like uh, unfair competition were as commonplace 35 years ago in regard to Japan as they are now widespread in this mm. country uh, about, about China. Hmm. Uh, I think we have room for time <laughs> for on, uh, help me out. maybe one <laughs> very brief question or maybe one brief comment from Jean, and then yes. we'll just go through the panel and see if anybody has final yeah. thoughts. I, I think there actually is a critical difference. Um, China is mm. trying to build a blue water navy, and this actually goes back mm. to the Arctic, why that's important. And the remilitarization, mm. I think we have not seen escalation like this, and we have not even touched that, and thank you for bringing that up. Mm. So you're saying that maybe they're not completely comparable? Mm. Not quite. Not the kind of, because China's not just an economic threat, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's trying to. That's where you were going. Yeah, the it is going for mm -hmm. a one bundle package deal where it actually tries to dominate on every front, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we have room for either one more question from the floor, okay? Mm -hmm. And then a very, very brief question and brief responses. I don't know how brief this is. Can you hear me? I don't know how brief this is, but who are we fixing the world for? 500 years of Western capitalism has created a few inequities. Are those going to be addressed in the next few years? <laughs> well, you have no idea of the uh, 
the nature of the world's inequities in the year 1500. <laughs> <laughs> I would just add so, something to that. Although inequality within countries has grown massively, uh, global inequality has not. In fact, it's declined. And, the, and if you look at the number of people have pulled, been pulled out of poverty globally mm -hmm. in the last 40 years, it's an, actually not a depressing story. And it might be, if you want a happier note on which to end, maybe that's it. <laughs> and, and that's also a China story. It is. It is. <laughs> All right. That sounds good to me. See you upstairs. Good. Good. Thank you.